Hey, thanks for tuning in to watch this sermon. You know, we believe the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. We also believe it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So I hope this message is a blessing to you. Matthew 24. Um, I want to read this verse that I'm going to read is, is really the key verse for us uh, this morning. Last Sunday, uh, we talked about, uh, out of Philippians chapter 1, we talked about the love of God and how, uh, what it looks like when God's love grows up in us, when it matures in us. And I wanted to kind of, I wanted to take, as I mentioned last Sunday, I wanted to take the next couple of Sundays and really just kind of uh, drill down and talk more about just the different characteristics, aspects, the dynamics of the strength of God's love in us and through us, how we, how we experience that, how we uh, reflect that and, and express that towards others. And so this key verse here, and I'm just going to jump, I'll just give you an idea just so you know right off the bat what we're going to be talking about. But this, this key verse here um, in, in Matthew, uh, there's two parts to it. And uh, what we're going to take a look at is we're going to look at what Jesus has to say about the love of God uh, in the last days. And so when the time is drawing near, and that's what Matthew 24 is about, Jesus is is uh, relaying and sharing some of the different uh, um, signposts that we can look to and we can look at that let us know that the end is near. And so there's several things that he says that when you see these things, know that the end is near. Uh, not the end of life, but the end of this age as it is. And so uh, this is, Matthew 24, is one of those signs. And here's what he says. Because of lawlessness, I'm sorry, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And so one of the many signs that Jesus said, when you see these things, know that the end is near. Well, in this verse are two of them, lawlessness. When you see that abounding, you know that the end is near. But the other thing that he says, it's really the, the, the main point of the verse, is that the love of many will grow cold. One of the greatest attacks that the enemy will have on the earth, on humanity, on the body of Christ, will be against the love of God. That's one of the greatest attacks the enemy will have, will be against the love of God. And so if we look at this verse and we, and, we, and we break this verse into two pieces, we look at the first part of it, there's two parts to it, because lawlessness will abound. And of course, you know, we've seen that, we continue to see just incredible, bizarre, really bizarre, expre- I mean, I'm 63 years old, so, um, and it, yeah, and I've been aware of things, you know, probably from high school on, because before high school, you're not really aware of much, you're, you, you, you know, your brain's not even developed fully. You're not even completely aware. Uh, I mean, it is, but I mean, you're just focused on sports and all that stuff. And, and so, uh, but, but I'm, what I'm saying is like more in my adult life, I have never in my, if somebody would have told me the type of lawlessness that we would see, that people would break into stores and steal things and walk out and nothing would be done, I would have told them, you are from a different planet. There's no way that's going to happen. I just couldn't even imagine it. But Jesus said, the scriptures tell us that as we get closer, when the, when the headlines, so to speak of the newspaper start to read more like the back of the Bible, then we know we're, (laughs) there's something going on here. And so one of the things that Jesus talked about was lawlessness, but, but, but because of the lawlessness is there because of the lawless one, the lawless one, uh, when you see that in the scriptures, it's making reference to Satan. The lawless one is Satan. And so the lawlessness that we see is a result of the activity of the lawless one. Uh, and so Jesus describes for us uh, in several scriptures, but here's one in John chapter 8. He describes some of the characteristics, the nature, if I, I could say it that way, of the lawless one. And so one of the things he says is that he's a murderer. And this is in John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus described Satan, or the lawless one, as a murderer. What does that tell us? That tells us that he's violent. 
He's aggressive. He's vicious. He's merciless. There is no mercy at all. His hate is so intense. Matter of fact, just as God does it, for example, God doesn't just love, God is love. Satan doesn't just hate, he is hate, right? And it's not a passive hate. It's it, according to what Jesus is saying is he's a murderer, which means all he wants to do is to destroy everything he sees that looks like God, that reminds him of God. Uh, it, he goes on to say there's no truth in him. It means there's nothing good in him. Nothing. In other words, there's nothing to appeal to. There's nothing to negotiate with. There's nothing to reason with. There's no reasoning with the, with the enemy, Jesus is saying. There's no reasoning with him. There's no, there's no negotiating with him. You can't come to terms with him. You can't make a treaty with him. You can't make peace with him because he literally has no truth in him. And so we know, for example, again, in contrast, God just doesn't tell the truth. The scripture says he is truth. Jesus, uh, uh, Satan doesn't just tell lies. He is a liar. He is deception. I mean, that's his very nature. And all of that is bent towards and focused on completely erasing, eradicating, eliminating, stamping out any expression of God that he sees on the earth. Jesus described Satan again in this way in John chapter 10. He says, he's a thief. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. And he's not even just satisfied to steal and kill. He's not just satisfied to take something from you and I and cause us to experience loss. Jesus says he'll do that. He steals and he kills. But he's not even just satisfied with killing. He wants to completely destroy so once he kills, he wants to completely destroy that thing that he's killed until there's literally nothing left. Remember that verse, we, we looked at this verse where it says Satan is a, a, a roams about like a roaring or prowls about like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. And we look at that word devour, which literally means to slurp up. And the, and the idea is the pictures of that Greek word that Peter is using to describe the nature of your enemy and my enemy. He's not just satisfied with ending our lives. He doesn't want anything around that look. I mean, he wants to completely annihilate us. And so that word devour is, is, is actually translated slurping or to slurp. And the picture is, is that the lion has, not, has killed its prey. It's devoured all the flesh off of it. And now it's literally licking up all the juices of the, of the flesh off the bone. And literally it will gnaw on it until there's nothing left at all of that. Isn't that interesting? Peter described the devil as that. That's what your enemy's like. Just want you to know. Now, thank God we have a, we have a savior. We have a redeemer. But the scripture still wants us to understand the nature of the enemy. So he is the lawless one who's creating all this lawlessness that ultimately affects or is trying to affect the love of God or can affect the love of God in people's lives. His characteristic, his nature is, is he wants to erase, he wants to erase the expression of God from the earth. Any expression of God from the earth. Satan does not want to look at anything on this planet that reminds him of God. Anything that reminds him of the one who created him the one who cast him out of heaven. Satan wants to be God. Satan wanted to be God. He still wants to be God. So, but he's so full of hate, ladies and gentlemen, that he wants to completely erase, eliminate any expression of God on the earth. This is why, for example, we're, this is why we're dealing with and we're seeing this super aggressive, violent, really aggressive whole gender issue thing and this whole sexual perversion thing. This is why we're seeing it. And now why do I say that? Well, in Genesis, it tells us, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The verse goes on to say, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what does that have to do with this whole gender thing? Satan looks at you and I 
even in our flaws, even in our humanity, he looks at man being created. Remember, the Bible says God created them male and female, two genders, right? You see what I'm saying? And we're made in the image and likeness of God. God created us in his image and likeness. When Satan looks at you and I, he sees the image and likeness of God, the one whom he hates. So he hates you. Jesus said that. Jesus said, if the world hates me, the world's going to hate you. Why? Because you're going to be my expression. You're going to reflect me on the earth. Does this make sense, everybody? I'm just telling you where all this stuff's coming from. It's not political. It's certainly not science. I mean, you can identify as anything you want, but when you're dead and they dig your bones up and they do a DNA, t- DNA t- test, you're going to be male or female. That's it. Right? I mean, so my point is that when, when we're, we're dealing with all of this, because it, I'm trying to help you see where it's coming from. I'm not, I'm not trying to attack anybody, but I, but I am... I am confronting a spirit that basically wants to destroy the image and likeness of God on the earth, which is destroy man. So Satan's like, I'll just pervert it. I'll just twist it. So it makes it difficult. He wants to be able to look at somebody that doesn't reflect God, that reflects his own perversion. Same thing with marriage. God created marriage. God invented marriage. Every time I do a wedding, I I work in the idea that Paul describes marriage with uh, the relationship of of the husband and wife in a marriage relationship. Paul describes that in Ephesians 5 with uh, with, uh, Jesus and his church, us being his bride, we the church, Jesus being the groom. The reason why Paul did, the reason why he does that is not because he's confused. Paul realizes that when God created marriage, Yes, he wanted Adam to have a helpmate. He wanted there to be a relationship. He, he wanted Adam to have someone. You know, so the companionship, all of that is beautiful. And, God's, and that's a, one of the reasons why God created marriage. But folks, let me tell you something. The ultimate reason for your marriage is not to satisfy loneliness. And it's not just so we can procreate. The ultimate purpose of the marriage relationship created by God So he gets to decide what the purpose is because he created it. The ultimate purpose is God wanted a human relationship on the earth that would reflect the most sacred of all relationships, our relationship as the bride of Christ to our groom Jesus. Amen? So, so... This is why this is why Satan has done what he what he what he's done everything he can to try to redefine marriage because when he looks at traditional marriage he understands what it is it reflects it, it represents it's an expression of God to him it's an expression of the gospel to him well he can't destroy marriage because God created it so he just perverts it and so now it's not, for, it's not between one, and the definition now, not between one man and one woman. Now the world, the, 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 the people of, of humanity can redefine marriage all they want. It, it doesn't change the ultimate purpose of it, and it doesn't change what it actually is, but it, do, it is an attempt to pervert it. All I'm, trying to, all I'm explaining to you right here is that Satan does not want to see any expression of God on the earth. He's violent, he's aggressive, He is so intense. He's vicious. He's merciless. And all he wants to do is every time he sees something that that reminds him of God, he wants to eliminate it or by perverting it. And so I'm just telling you, that's what's happening. And the same is true with the church as a whole, both individually and, and, and specifically, I want to talk about the church collectively. When, when the enemy looks at the church, he recognizes that the church is the expression of God on the earth. We are God's expression. Ephesians chapter 1 says that, that, God, that, that Jesus will fill himself within his church, and through the church he will cause everything to be filled up with him. So Jesus will fill everything, everywhere, with himself through his church. Not through nature, through his people. As infallible as we are, as human as we are, as imperfect as we are, God has chosen to have a family, to have his people on his earth, right? And he calls us the church, and we're joined together by the Spirit of God. 
And so, but the purpose of that is that we are to be his expression of redemption, of hope, of truth, of life, of healing. We are to be his expression on the earth. Does this make sense, everybody? We see so many scriptures that talk about that. So again, just like with, just like with uh, man, uh, just man and his sexuality or marriage, when Satan looks at the church, he wants to destroy it. He wants to eliminate it because it reminds him of God, and he doesn't want to be reminded of God. He wants to eliminate any reflection of God at all. Well, how does he do that with the church? He tries to do that by causing the church to turn on itself and cause the love of God to grow cold. Jesus said, here's how you know when we're coming to the end. When lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. And the love that he's referring to is not our love for the world. He's referring to our love for one another. John chapter 13 says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I've loved you. You should love each other. For your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. So I said before, in the last days, the greatest attack will be on the love of God. And the church is God's expression. Therefore, Satan wants to erase from the earth the expression of the, or the strength of the church. He can't destroy the church because he didn't create it. So what he'll try to do is weaken it or cripple it. And he'll try to do that through causing our love for one another to grow cold. Again, look at John 13. He says, it's your love for one another that will prove to the world that you're my disciples. See, our love for, so it's, it, it, yes, we have love for the world, but Jesus says one of the greatest evangelistic expressions that you'll have, one of the greatest expressions that you'll have, <clears throat> pardon me, that will convince the world that the gospel is for real and that God is for real is not even so much how you love the world, but it's how you love each other. That's why in John 17, he spent all that time praying for the unity of his church, that his church would be unified, they would be held together, they would be connected, they would be glued together by the love of God that they have for one another. And here in John 13, he says, that's how they're going to know. <clears throat> they're gonna, the world's going to know that this whole gospel is for real, not based on what we do. Yes, we do things for the world. Yes, we we. We outreach, we reach out to the world, yes. But he says, you know what? They're really going to be convinced. They'll really be convinced when they see that you love each other. And, 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 and if you look at Paul's letters, Paul's writings to the local church, uh, to, to his writings to the different churches there. And really what Paul is doing is he's establishing a social order, not just a biblical order, but he's establishing a social order in the church. He says, all right, here's how you take care of widows. Here's who, who qualifies for, for help if they're a widow. Here's how you take care. Here's how you take care and love your own. And you read Paul's letters, there's so many things in there where he talks about, here's how you deal with conflict, here's how you resolve your differences, here's how you take, matter of fact, he says, don't take each other to court. There's going to be a time in the millennial reign that you're going to be reigning with Jesus. You're going to be reigning entire nations. You need to be able to take care of your conflict with each other without going outside to the world, see? And so Paul's talking about all this stuff. But one of the reasons why Paul's doing that is he's saying, look, we need to have a community within the body of Christ where we are so committed to each other, even when it's difficult to be committed to each other, that causes the world to be jealous, that they're looking in the window inside of the church and they see how we love each other and they think, I want that. I tried to get that at the bar. I tried to get that at the nightclub. I tried to get that at my, at my workout gym buddies. I'm not getting that kind of love. I'm not seeing that kind of commitment. I want that. Are you following what I'm saying, right? It's just like when Jesus said, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out on the Gentiles. God's going to bless them so much that you Jews that don't want to receive me are going to be provoked to jealousy. What's going on? Just submit. You'll get the same reward. 
right? And so, in other words, Paul's saying, as you, as you, you and I are love, so the enemy knows this. So Satan says, if I can get them to cause their love to grow cold, actually that phrase grow cold translated in the Greek means to blow upon. So it's what would you do if you get a really hot cup of soup, but you can't really eat it yet because it's too hot, right? You blow on it till it gets cool enough. In other words, Jesus said this cold love will be a cooling off. It's gradual, almost imperceptible. But over time, there's different things that happen in our lives that we allow our hearts to not initially hate, but just get cool towards someone else. I can do without them. Are you following what I'm saying, everybody? Here's what it says in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4. He says this, above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Above all things, above all things, Have fervent, everybody say fervent. Fervent Fervent love for one another. That word fervent in the Greek translated means stretched out. In other words, he's saying have the kind of love that you continue to love even when your love's being stretched out. Even when that person is stretching you. You're stretching me to my breaking point. You're stretching me. Anybody ever feel that way about somebody other than your spouse, right? Well, you're stretching me right now. You're thinking, I don't know how much more of this I can take, right? Anybody? Come on. We all have been through that. And it's not the stranger that stretches us. It's the people we're closest to that usually stretch us, right? And so Paul, so I'm sorry, Peter said, here's the kind of love you need to have. Don't let the enemy blow the, the, with the winds of hell, blow on your heart and cause your heart, your, the love of God in your heart to be cooled towards someone else. Instead, be fervent. Have the kind of love where the Holy Spirit is constantly stirring that love up so that even when you're being stretched to what you think is the breaking point, you find a grace to continue to love fervently. You refuse to look at that person as somebody you can do without. Come on, everybody. Based on that verse, our love, the love of God in our hearts, we see here in 1 John, is affected by our love for others. Here's what John says in 1 John chapter 4. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person's a liar. For if we don't love people who we can see, how can we love God whom we can't see? So this is the command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. So again, so many verses talking about how we relate to each other. Yes, we be kind and compassionate, loving towards the world. That's easy. I'm telling you, be honest with yourself. That's easier than to love the person that you have to live with or that you have to do life with. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? that you have to interact with, that's harder. Amen? You don't stay mad at the person that cuts you off at traffic that long. (laughs) By the time you get to your destination, you forgot about it. But that person you were close to that hurts you, you don't forget that easy. Come on. Right? And (laughs) And so what John is saying is that here's the truth of this. It's really, it's really a, a, a strong truth, but think about this. Our love for God is affected by our love for others. Every time we allow our hearts to cool toward others, there's an aspect of our heart that's growing cold towards God. The deception is I can love God at the same level and choose not to love someone else. That is a deception. I'm telling you what the Bible says. It's a deception That's a lie from the enemy that says, I can love God the same, so I can, and therefore I can afford to not love or forgive someone else. And the scriptures, the Bible tells us it doesn't work that way. That when I allow my love to cool towards others, I really am, whether I realize it or not, there's an aspect of my love for God that's 
cooling. It's true. That's why the scriptures are so clear that how we love others is really the litmus test of how much we love God. Jesus said you can sum up the entire law with two commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, but the second is just, is, is, is just as powerful as the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Does that make sense, everybody? So look, if we can't love our neighbor as ourselves, we're fooling ourselves if we think we're loving God real good. How do I know whether my love for God is where it needs to be? Well, I'll tell you how we can tell. It's just like how you can tell when you have a temperature. You put the thermometer in your mouth, you hold it in there under your tongue for a while, or I guess now they can just, they can just ray gun you, right? I mean, <laughs> but there's some kind of, you know, there's something there that tells you you have a temperature, right? And so how do we know when the temperature is cooled toward God? The scripture says we look at how we love others. Oh, I know this isn't a shouting, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord point. I get that, I know, because we're... <laughs> I know there's probably half of us thinking about people we don't like that well. <laughs> and we're thinking, oh, I don't know if I like that. But it's true. If I want to know how well I'm doing with the Lord, all I need to do is look at where my heart's at towards others. Not how they are towards me. I can't control that. How I am towards them. Is my, lo is my love cooled for them? Or is my love still where it needs to be? Am I loving my neighbor as myself? Amen. Does that make sense, everybody? Two more points here. Two more points. The measure of your love is found in the depth of your commitment. Again, love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. No one will ever attain, no one will ever attain the fullness of God without being committed to imperfect people along the way. Can I say that again? No one will ever attain the fullness of God. I don't care how hard you're trying to get it. The only way to experience the fullness of God, that requires me being willing to be committed to imperfect people along the way. That my commitment stays strong even when they've failed me in some way. Amen. Does that make sense, everybody? I've seen preachers who are in their 30s who were jaded and angry by all the disappointments they've had in ministry. Then I've seen men in their 90s who spent their whole lives in ministry and their hearts are tender and childlike. I mean, it's like they still love people. And you know, if, you, if they took their shirt off, there would be all kinds of gashes and wounds on their back from other people hurting them. And yet you wouldn't even know it by talking to them because they're so sweet. How did you maintain that sweetness? They wouldn't allow the love of God to grow cold in their heart. Amen. They wouldn't let the devil steal that from them. Last point. The ones who possess the kingdom of God in its fullness are the ones who allow God's love to overcome the faults of others. Here's what it says in Colossians 3. And then we're going to pray. Make allowance for each other's faults. Make allowance for each other's faults. We, sometimes we have this standard. We, we create this standard of how we want people to act or respond to us. And it's a standard that we have, that we've created, that we think in a perfect world, this is how they should act. This is how they should re respond. This is how they should be, right? And in a perfect world, I'm sure that standard, that definition is accurate. But we don't live in a perfect world. And we don't love perfect people. And we're not perfect. Right? So our tendency is, is that we, we, wanna, we want grace and mercy, but we have trouble sometimes extending grace and mercy. <laughs> right? And so what Paul is saying here in Colossians, and again, notice this is a, another one of those verses where Paul is saying, look, guys, we got to ace this. This loving each other, even though we're upset with each other or we're having difficult with each other or the relationship is strained or there's been disappointments in the relationship. Paul is saying, guys, John said it, Peter said it, Paul. They're saying, guys, we got to ace this. We've got to ace this. We can't afford to 
fail this test. Your own heart is dependent on it. The way you love God is dependent on it. And how the world looks at us is dependent on whether or not we ace this. We cannot afford to mess this up, right? So he says in Colossians 3, make allowance for each other's faults. Why? Because we have them. And forgive anyone who offends you. Forgiveness is not tolerance. I'll be in the same room with that person. I've forgiven them. You may not. You may just be tolerating them. Oh, folks, are you hearing what I'm saying? Look, I'm not talking about a humanistic definition of love. We're talking about the love of God and the genuine love of God and what it looks like. See, the deception is so great. Last week we said, here's how deceptive the devil is. He can trick you and I so, so quickly that we literally, we literally need the love of God, the wisdom that comes from the love of God to recognize the deception of the devil. Otherwise, we're in trouble. So we're not, talking about a, we're not talking about a humanistic or our own definition of love. We're talking about what does the Bible say? What does God's love look like? Well, here's what it looks like. We make allowance for each other's faults. And we don't just tolerate people. From the heart, we actually forgive them. And it says this, remember the Lord forgave you. <laughs> so you must forgive others. That kind of puts it in perspective, right? And above all, it says, clothe yourselves with love. Those are the clothes you and I are to wear, love. In other words, love isn't just something we tip somebody with. Love is not something that we just kind of, let me give you like we're tipping, you know, tipping the, the, the server at the restaurant or the valet guy. We're just tipping. No, he's saying that, that's not how you react, uh, respond to each other in love. It's not something that you just kind of, oh, here's a little bit of, here's a little dab of love for you right here. Paul is saying, literally, clothe yourself. I mean, those are the clothes you wear. In other words, that's how you function. That's how you act. That's how you walk. But even more importantly, that's how you think. That's how you interpret. That's how you define. That's how you translate everything around you from the perspective of the love of God. That'll keep us from being fooled too, right? But it says, clothe yourself with God's love. Just put on, just completely... Not just a pair of shoes. Every part of your clothing should be the love of God. Why? Well, it's the love of God, he goes on to say, that binds us together in perfect harmony or unity. Unity and harmony is not, is not, is not uh, the absence of disagreement. Because we all have those, right? Harmony, unity that the Bible's talking about is that we don't allow the disagreements to define the relationship or to determine our love for somebody. Right? Yeah, we have them. You can focus on that all day long with your spouse and you're going to be divorced pretty soon. But you can have them. And Bonnie and I have been married 42 years. You know we've had disagreements. Often. She thinks one way, I think another way. She has an opinion, I have another opinion. She's sometimes wrong, I'm right most of the time. No, that's not true. I just wanted to see if you were listening, that's not true. That was just, <laughs> that was a, I don't know you, that's not true. It's not true. But you can focus on those things or you can focus on, you can focus on the love of God. And, and, and really what God's love does is God, God's love covers a multitude of sins. God's love covers a multitude of weaknesses. God's love covers a multitude of humanity. God love covers it all. God love trumps it all. God love aces over all of it. First Corinthians 13 says that these three remain, but the greatest of these is what? God's, uh, the, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says is that God's love never fails. Self-ambition fails. Bitterness fails. Unforgiveness fails. Anger always fails. Judgment always fails. Ultimately, right? But the love of God never fails. That is the one thing that Satan cannot eliminate off the earth is God's love. Because he can't eliminate God. Because God is love. Amen. Does that make sense, everybody? It's the greatest weapon. 
It's our secret weapon. When we're in battle and we're putting on the full armor of God, we're supposed to put on love. So our greatest weapon, man, the, the, the secret weapon we have is if we feel like we're losing, we just pull out the power of God's love and we're slaying our enemy. He has no recourse for the love of God. Amen, everybody. i like for us to stand. I think I've hammered on this enough. Pressed down on it enough, I mean. And I'm going to ask the worship team to, to lead us. And we have the tables communion tables that are open and as I said before one of the ways that Paul described the communion table is he said this on the night that Jesus was betrayed that's how he described communion he described it in something that happened in the midst of a great betrayal in the midst of a great heartache in the midst of a great heartbreak and let me tell you something about how deceptive the enemy is the prophecies that were made about Jesus, the Messiah, being uh, betrayed, there was no name mentioned. It didn't say in the Old Testament Judas would betray Jesus. I'm telling you, it didn't have to be Judas. Somebody was going to betray the Christ. That was prophetic. It didn't have to be him. It became him because of his heart. He allowed his heart to grow cold and to cool off towards Jesus. And the enemy came in there and he deceived him. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? That's how much we need the love of God because the enemy is that, is that diabolical, right? And so, Father, right now, as we worship you at your table, as we worship you at your table, as we remind ourselves of your broken body and your shed blood, as we maybe even come and kneel here at the front, we might need to come to the front and we might need to carry in our hearts and minds somebody with us when we come to the front today when we go to the table your table of grace some of us may need to be some of us may need to carry that person in our heart and mind that we've been struggling with we may need to carry them in our mind to the table we may need to carry that person in our mind in our heart to the front here and this altar but Lord, may we do that. May we carry the thing that is the enemy has been using to mess us up and to twist our heart up and to cause our love to grow cold. May we carry that situation, that, that individual, may we carry that to a place where there's freedom, where we can present that. We can lay that on the altar of your love right now and sacrifice the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the fear, the hurt, the wound. May we sacrifice it on the altar of the love of God that never fails. Let's just respond to him now, ladies and gentlemen, as the worship team leads us. Make your way to the tables, make your way to the front, but let's obey him now in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching online. Don't forget to follow us on social media at New Life Corpus. We'd love for you to join us Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. God bless.